Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for the BB&T Now Truest Lecture in Free Enterprise. We are thrilled to have you with us today. Uh, I'm Faye McIntyre. I'm Dean of the Richards College of Business at the University of West Georgia. So on behalf of the Richards College, welcome to this lecture. We are uh, excited about this. There's a long history here. So I wanna take just a minute to give you a little bit of the background on this. We wanna thank Truist Bank, uh, which was originally BB&T for their generous contribution and most important for their support and their partnership over these years. Uh, the, this BB&T donation was our first million dollar donation for the Richards College of Business. It was a 10 year commitment and we have been able to do a lot of things with this donation. The Lecture and Free Enterprise series is one of those. We had a number of projects for our Inactus students. It funded student research and student travel to conferences along with faculty conferences and research. A lot of things have happened in, uh, in response to this partnership. And I wanna thank BB&T, now Truist. I wanna just congratulate Kelly King, who's gonna be with us today on what a terrific team of people you have working with you. We have had a lot of folks over the years that, with BB&T that have worked with us. Preston Etheridge, you're gonna meet in just a minute. Uh, Bill Kilberg, Richard Carswell, Jasmine Franks, who works with our Emerging Leaders Program. Uh, today, we wanna thank especially Kimberly Burns and Brad Godwin for their help with this virtual event. Uh, but the one person that I want to thank in particular is Tammy Hughes. She has been with us from the very beginning. She's the Senior Vice President for Relationship Management and uh, is just a terrific partner with the Richards College of Business. Uh, our mission statement is very clear and it's succinct. We're in the business of transforming lives through education, engagement, and experiences. And I think we can all say that the past year has been an experience like none other for all of us. This, this lecture was originally scheduled for spring of last year and was postponed. So we are thrilled to have Mr. Kelly King with us today. You're gonna to get an official welcome and introduction in just a minute on him. But I wanna say this is a nice capstone. We started the bb &T lecture series 10 years ago with uh, John Allison, who was the CEO of bb &T at that point. So the fact that we're able to have Mr. King with us today is, is truly a, a pleasure and an honor for us. So before I turn the mic over, I've got just two really quick logistical notes. After the lecture series, we are going to have some uh, Q&A. So if you have a question for Mr. King, please put that in your chat function. And then second, for those students who want to demonstrate to your faculty member that you are here and listening and engaged, uh, please uh, just hang on with us. We're gonna give them a list of everybody who is in attendance by the end of this week. So thank you again for being with us. Thank you for your time and attention. And now I'm gonna turn it over to the University of West Georgia's Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost, Dr. John Preston. Thank you, Dean McIntyre. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. On behalf of the University of West Georgia, I'd like to welcome you to the BB&T Lecture in Free Enterprise. And we're excited to host engaging, impactful speakers. As Dean McIntyre mentioned, this is a tremendous opportunity for our community to come together, explore new ideas and opportunities in entrepreneurship. As a regional comprehensive university, UWG is committed to state economic growth as part of that University System of Georgia strategic imperative. And we believe that transforming lives means transforming businesses. So this is a fantastic opportunity for us to live out that core mission of our university. Now I'd like to introduce market president for BB&T, now Truist Commercial Banking, uh, someone who I think has a fantastic name, Preston Etheridge, who will be introducing our guest speaker. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Etheridge. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Preston. And good afternoon, everyone. Hope you all are doing well and enjoying some of this nice spring weather. I am excited to be here with you all today and I had the honor of introducing our guest speaker. Kelly King is chairman and CEO of Truist Financial Corporation. Uh, Kelly began his career in 1972, joining the management development program of what was then bb &T, which is now Truist. His career at BB&T, now Truist, included leadership roles in commercial and retail banking, operations, 
insurance, corporate financial services, investment services, and capital markets. In December of 2019, Kelly became chairman and CEO of Truist, created through the merger of equals between BB&T and SunTrust. Kelly is very involved in the community and serves on the board of the Financial Services Roundtable and has served on the board of the Clearinghouse since 2009. He is a board member for Best NC and a member of the National Leadership Advisory Council for High Point University. He is a native of North Carolina where he earned a bachelor's degree in business administration and a master's in business administration from East Carolina University. He is also a graduate of the Stonier Graduate School of Banking at Rutgers University. So at this point, I would like to thank you all for being here today and please join me in welcoming our very <clears throat> own Mr. Kelly King. Well, thank you, Preston, and thank you, Dean McIntyre and Dr. Preston. It's a real honor to be with you all today. I've been looking forward to this. As you said, Dean McIntyre, our relationship with the university goes back a long way. Uh, we are very proud of what you all have done uh, in leading in your broad geographical area, area but more importantly, uh, graduating outstanding students uh, to be leaders uh, in business and other areas of the community across the country and I suppose across the world. So I think a big congratulations is in order to for all of you. So uh, thank you for letting me join you. It is it is my honor. So to our students and I'm sure we have some faculty and maybe some business leaders. Uh, I hope we can spend some some time together the next hour and a half or so. Uh, and my goal uh, is uh, twofold. Uh, one is, uh, I want to say at least one thing that will be helpful to you professionally, uh, whether you're a faculty member or whether you're a professional student. Uh, I want to say something that will help and encourage you in that endeavor. And the other thing is I hope to say something that will be helpful to you personally. Uh, and if we can accomplish those two goals, uh, then I will feel like we had a really productive time together. And if we don't, then you have the you have my permission to send me a note and say you didn't quite hit it. Give me some more, and I'll come back and try to try to uh, finish the job. But uh, that's what I try to do when I meet with groups, but particularly students, because really, you know, my view is I'm speaking to the future of our country, and 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 really the world. And so it's really important to try to help you have as good a start uh, on your life as we as we possibly can. So I want to talk to you today about what I call leadership in challenging times. Uh, and if you think about the essence of free enterprise, a free enterprise is really uh, successful or not based on the effectiveness of leadership. That happens to, by the way, be true in all facets of society. Uh, and so when we think about free enterprise and we want it to be as successful as possible, we want our leadership to be as effective as possible. Uh, and it calls into question just how effective are we as leaders in difficult periods of time? And surely these are difficult periods of time. I think we could all agree on that. Um, I've been, over the years, I bet I've read hundreds uh, of leadership books and I'm sure many of the faculty would say, yep, me too. Uh, and so I have tried to crystallize uh, in my own mind, just what really are the characteristics of outstanding uh, leaders? And there really are three. Uh, and one is that leaders have a, a, a very clear view of the reality. They're very honest about where they are. <clears throat> the second is they have a very clear vision about where they want to go. And the third is they have the courage to go there. And so I think it's important for us in thinking about leadership in these times to take a look at those three those three areas. And so when we think about the reality that we are facing, uh, it's very, very important to just be as directly honest as we can be <clears throat> about that reality because the reason this makes so much sense, at least to me, is if you're not honest about where you are, then you can be really fooled about where you're trying to go. I mean, how can you be really clear about what your goals are going to be if you don't know where, where you are, what your reality is uh, today? So being a very objective, rational thinker is a big part of being a very successful leader. So let's talk a minute about the reality that we face today. Uh, the first is, and, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm coming up on my 49th year 
uh, with the bank. And so I've been around for a while and I've seen some, some cycles, but I've never seen anything like this. I mean, you know, we have the convergence of a global pandemic, a global economic crisis, uh, really important but, but stressful and difficult discussions around racial inequity and social injustice. Uh, now, you know, starting on January 6th, we have an explosion of political issues that are upon us that continue even through <clears throat> this day. Uh, and, and, and in our company, and then I'm sure you can add two or three things to your list, in our company, we're going through a merger of equals, uh, putting two large banks together, creating the sixth largest commercial bank in the country. Uh, the I think the, the fourth largest bank uh, combination in the history of banking. So it's a, it's a big deal. And so we kind of got a lot going on. And, and uh, so that challenges us as leaders and tests the effectiveness of our, of our leadership skills. I will say that with regard to COVID, uh, I am encouraged in terms of where we are. And like you, uh, I get a lot of reports and information about where we are, but surely things are getting better. I mean, vaccines are, are being much more available today I mean, even in North Carolina, just today, literally, uh, <clears throat> vaccines are now available for anybody that's 16 years of age and older. Some other states have already uh, moved in advance of that. But, but very shortly, anybody that wants to get a vaccine is going to be able to get a vaccine. And we've certainly seen the efficacy of the vaccines as the rate of positive cases have gone down, the hospitalizations have gone down, deaths have gone down. Uh, and so that's really, really good news, you know, because number one, it's 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 just it's just physically and psychologically, emotionally really important to get this pandemic under control because it's really hard to move to any other aspect of life. If you're if we're honest about it, if you're sitting there worrying about you might go outside and you might see somebody or touch somebody and you might die. I mean, it creates a whole nother level of conscious and unconscious anxiety, stress and outright fear. And so I think the good news is things are looking much better. My own uh, prediction based on reading a lot and hearing a lot from national leaders that are really on the forefront of what's going on, I think we can really think by the summer uh, in terms of the COVID situation not gone away, but being in a dramatically better place than it is today. Uh, and I think that will serve to reduce fear, instill confidence, and that'll put us on the road to substantial improvement with regard to the economy. Now, with regard to the economy, uh, I also feel much, much better about that than six months ago, certainly a year ago. I mean, a year ago, you know, bankers were sitting around wringing our hands and just wondering where in the world is this going? I mean, you know, loan losses are going through the roof, there'll be no growth, uh, interest rates are low, about, you know, every negative aspect of uh, economic characteristics for banking was what we were facing. But in fact, it has been less uh, difficult than we thought. Plenty hard, but less difficult. Um, and I think the reason is because, number one, people in our country, maybe around the world, but I can speak better about our country, are really very resilient. I I'm sure you've seen that. I mean, it's just been amazing to me how, how well people have, have come back and kept a positive attitude and kept the businesses open, even if it's on the street, uh, shoelace. Uh, schools have figured out how to do remote classes and restaurants have more outside seating. I mean, it's just been amazing. Very innovative, very creative. And that's that's very encouraging for, for the future. So as we think about the economy now looking forward, you know, I think uh, most economists are thinking that this year's GDP will be in the 6 to 8% uh, range, which is a really, from a long-term point of view, a huge increase, and that's coming off a slower base uh, in 20, but still really, really strong. And uh, some believe, I believe, that the, we will have a very robust economic recovery for at least the next couple of years. You may find it interesting to, to think about why the economy is coming back faster than many people thought it would. I said back six or eight months ago when being asked about this, I said, it was just my own way of thinking about it, that I thought that as we headed towards the 
mid uh, latter part of the year, we would have a much faster, robust recovery, uh, a snapback, as I called it, than most people expected. And here's why. Because if you go back and analyze previous cycles, take the 8990 uh, commercial real estate uh, uh, debacle. We, we had preceding that a really big boom in prices uh, and excesses in supply, and that created that. In 2000, we had the whole tech bubble. So another bubble created another recession. In 2008, we had the residential real estate bubble. But most big recessions are created by some economic abnormality, uh, and that's what's uh, preceded. This one did not have that characteristic. This one was following about 10 years of pretty robust, steady economic growth. There were no apparent excesses, no apparent bubbles. Uh, and so it's rational, I believe, to expect what we're seeing. That is to say, there was nothing fundamentally wrong with the economy. And so when you flip the switch back on, the economy can come back faster because you don't have all of these excesses which have to be washed out, which is basically what recessions do. And that's what we see. So we're seeing a quick recovery. I think that's going to be sustainable. Now we've got the whole issue of deficits and all that's going on now in terms of spending to, you know, to ensure the recovery. And we'll certainly have some negative consequences from that. But for the next two or three years, I think we can look forward to a fairly positive economic uh, recovery, and that will be very, very good. So COVID's getting better. Economy's getting better. Got to feel good about that. Now, what about the issue of racial inequity and social injustice? This is just a very challenging time for our country. Uh, clearly, uh, we are having, and I'm glad about this, some really healthy, good discussions in our company and outside about this issue. These issues have been around for a long time, and it is really good that, that we are now finally, in an honest, genuine way, in most cases, talking about it and trying to think about solutions because we do need to find solutions uh, to, to the, these challenges. And I'll talk about why that is true in a moment with regard to, <clears throat> to our, our, our vision for the, for the future. So having really good, help open discussions is important because go back to the leadership model. If you aren't honest and open about the reality, you're probably not going to set a really good visionary plan. We have not been honest about the reality, in my view, with regard to racial inequity and social injustice, in this country for a long, long time. It's been kind of under the rug and, and it would ebb and flow, but I think any of us that have studied history and have lived for a while would recognize that there's been, there's been uh, issues there that, that really should be dealt with. So it's really good news that we are now surfacing the reality. We're talking about it. Some people get mad about it. I don't like that. I prefer we didn't get mad about it. I prefer we talk about it and find solutions together, but at least we're talking about it. So that's really, really good as we chart a path, a vision towards the future uh, with regard to how to deal with that, uh, that challenge. And then we have the political reality. And this is just really interesting because, you know, who in the world would have expected what happened in the Capitol on January the 6th? Just a huge... Uh, uh, crisis. Uh, but it wasn't really just about what happened at the Capitol. That was the uh, result, I believe, of very deep divided views uh, concerning uh, political uh, uh, views of our, of our country. Been, been ebbing and flowing in terms of how obvious it has been, but it's been there a long time. And it's been deepening, uh, and, it's, and it's time to surface that as well. Uh, it's time to surface these deep, deep, deep political divisions. There's nothing wrong with having political differences of opinion. That's healthy. Uh, but it's unhealthy if you start fighting about it. Uh, uh, what's healthy is to have different views, have good open discussions, embrace a solution, and work together to create a better future for our country. That's what's healthy about political discourse uh, and, and discussions about what's going on. So we've got a ways to go. Uh, in terms of dealing with racial inequity, social injustice. We've got a ways to go to deal with uh, creating a better political environment, but I believe we will get there. Uh, I believe we will make progress and we will move in the, in the right direction, particularly if we can get centered on the vision. So I just described uh, briefly, I hope 
uh, you would view reasonably correctly the reality that we face as we sit here today. But what about the vision then? So where can we go from here? What's interesting, um, a lot of people don't understand just how important vision and purpose is. At Truist, we talk about purpose all the time because culture, whether it's a country, a community organization, or a company, culture drives the long-term performance. I'm just real clear about that. Uh, and so, you know, for example, at Truist, our purpose is to inspire and build better lives in communities. That's our reason for being. That's why we get up in the morning. We don't, I don't get up in the morning excited about making loans and getting deposits and making money and getting the stock price up. You know, I had to be a little careful about that when I talk to the shareholders, but I don't. <laughs> uh, what I get excited about is inspiring and building better lives in communities, uh, doing things like I'm doing right now, working with you all to help create, you know, a better future opportunity for the students that are involved in this uh, discussion. And so purpose is very, very important, and purpose drives uh, direction, energy, motivation. Purpose gives you the sense of northern star. Purpose is what happens when you get up in the morning or uh, you're in a period of, 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 of dramatic change like we're going through. It is purpose that keeps you going in the right direction. If you get up in the morning and you don't have clarity of purpose, then it's too easy for you to be blown to the left or the right and lose your sense of direction. Purpose is what you're trying to accomplish in your life, corporately or otherwise, and that's why purpose is so important. So what can we say about purpose with regard to our country? What can we say about purpose with regard to the vision for our country? And, and this is, I believe, the most important thing we could say for the great United States of America. Uh, and I'm going to do a quick check in here, Dr. McIntyre. I just saw a big X go across the screen, so I'm just going to check in and see if you can still hear me and see me. I can indeed. Okay, great. I just got a big X. I just want to make sure you didn't cut me off. If you cut me off, I was going to go try to make some loans. So, <laughs> uh, thank you for uh, for clarifying that. So, so look, purpose for our country is very, very important, and we don't have to invent our purpose. Our purpose was made clear several hundred years ago in the Declaration of, the in of Independence. And that declaration is that everyone has the inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Everyone. It doesn't say anything about color, uh, gender, how tall you are, or any other non-essential factors. It says everybody has the right to hope and opportunity in this great country of the United States of America. That's why this country was created. That's what it's all about. And that's what we need to focus on. Now, when we start talking about racial inequity and social injustice, when we talk, start talking about political divide and arguments and fights and hate and all of that, we're getting way, way, way away from our purpose. We need to pull everybody back together and focus on the purpose of this country. Because I believe we have had and we have and we can have in the future the greatest land in the world for our kids and our grandkids to be able to live out their dreams and goals and hopes in, in life. Uh, and yet that's not where we are today. Uh, back to the reality, we are not uh, offering that to everybody today. Look, in the public school system today, two-thirds of the kids in the fourth grade cannot read. Two-thirds cannot read. Now, educators tell you the obvious. When you hear it, you will recognize that, you know, up until about the third or fourth grade, you're learning how to read. And after that, you're reading to learn. And so if you get to the third or fourth grade and you can't read, you really do not have uh, opportunity and hope. When I grew up on a farm in eastern North Carolina a long time ago, even if you didn't have, didn't have a good education, you could still do manual labor. There were manual jobs in factories that you could do. Many of those jobs, most of those jobs have gone away. In order to survive and thrive in the world we live in today, it's really important that you have the right kind of education and skill set to be able to apply and do the jobs that are available. So we have to tackle some of these really, really big issues. I just pulled that one out because I personally think it's the most important one that we have to figure out an answer to. I will say, by the way, that at Truist, we've been working on a solution on this. I'm very proud of it. Uh, we started working about three years ago with a company called Everfy, who helped us create a game 
that we now uh, use in high schools all across the Southeast, a game that teaches financial literacy. Uh, we started working about three years ago on a game that teaches a kid how to read. We now have it in about 500 schools. Uh, several thousand students are doing our beta test. Uh, and we believe that that game is going to be a big supplement to teachers uh, in elementary school teaching these kids how to read. Uh, we hope to be able to take it nationally, uh, and we think we will make a big uh, dent in terms of helping these kids learn how to read so they can have a, a good opportunity for the, for the future. So there are challenges out there today. There are financial challenges. Uh, you know, about uh, two-thirds of the families in this country today cannot meet a $1,000 unexpected bill. Now, you think about that. That means if your refrigerator goes out, you're in really, really big trouble. That's where most of the families in our country are today. So we have economic inequity. We have challenges in economic mobility, opportunity to move up from where you started. Uh, and we need to do as much as we can to provide opportunities in all of these areas as we go forward. So clearly, these are challenging times. Uh, but one can ask the question, so, well, are, are you saying you're just really pessimistic? No, I'm actually very, very optimistic because to me, at least, I, I see the vision. I see where we can go. And I know leadership is the answer. And I know we have bright people like the ones on this, this webcast today. You are the future. You can solve these problems. You can create solutions like this reading game. You can find solutions and ways to go forward. Uh, and we can have a much, much brighter future than we've had uh, in the past. And I will challenge you at a, at a personal level uh, related to this, something that I've found to be very interesting. So over the years, as I have looked at companies and individuals and looked at uh, the differences in performance, it's been very interesting. In very difficult periods of time, what I have observed is that about 90% of the companies, 90% of the people believe that they are a function of the environment so we're in a recession. I can't do very well. Don't You couldn't expect my business to do very well because we're in a recession. Uh, at the same time, facing the same condition, about 10% of the companies, about 10% of the individuals go ahead and do great things. They become top achievers. So I've been studying why is it that 10% can be top achievers facing the same difficulties that the 90% face. And I've determined that there are five characteristics, five traits, of outstanding achievers that I want to share with you. If you write these down and at least think about these, uh, and I believe apply these to your life, you will find that it will make an amazing difference in your ability to achieve your success and happiness in life. The first characteristic is that they believe absolutely and completely, passionately in what they're trying to accomplish. You take Olympians, for example, who will practice eight to 10 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year for years and years and years, you won't find them running around saying, oh, maybe I can be number 13 in the world. No, they believe to their toes that they can and will be the very best. That deep passion, that deep belief in their purpose, what they're trying to accomplish. That deep belief drives the second characteristic. And that is that they commit, they commit the time, energy, and resources to make it happen. Because you see, if you deeply believe in something, then you will commit yourself to it. Now, you like I have seen people say, I believe in this or I believe in that. And then you watch what they do and they don't do anything about it. That's not a real true deep belief. If you deep, deeply believe in something, then you will be committed to making it happen. At Truist, we have a leadership model. It's very simple, but very powerful. It says that beliefs drive behaviors, behaviors drive results. So if you're going to change results in life, you have to change your behaviors. That makes sense. If you're going to change behaviors on a sustained basis, you have to change beliefs. So that deep belief, that passion drives the second trait, which is a commitment to making that purpose uh, really happen. And then the third characteristic is important. That is they train, they train themselves so that they indeed have the best skills in what they're trying to do. Like these Olympians I referred to in business, in academia. If you're going to be the best student in your class, you can't just say, hey, I believe I can be. I'd like to be. It'd be neat to be. What have you got to do? You got to study hard. You got to tra train. You got to study, commit the time and energy, uh, because ultimately in life it is the skill set that you have that makes the difference. So 
You're never going to have the best skills unless you train relentlessly. You're never going to train relentlessly unless you believe passionately in what you're trying to do. That's why students are so important for you, wherever you are in, in your journey along waiting, uh, looking for your degree. Wherever you are, it's very important for you to be committed to being the best that you can possibly be. Be, be committed when you come out, when you get ready to do whatever you are going to do and all along the stages of your journey in your, in your life, be committed to being the best that you can possibly be by training relentlessly. I'm sorry to tell you this, when you are graduated and you have your degree, you just started your education. And so if you will be a person who learns and grows throughout your life, you will be much more successful and happy. The fourth characteristic of outstanding leaders is that they enjoy the journey. And this is very, very important. And this is a, a sad thing about life because most people do not understand the essence of life. The essence of life is that life exists right here, right now. This is your God-given day to live, right now, today. You can't change yesterday and you do not have tomorrow promise. I'm sorry, that's just the way life is. But sadly, too many people live in the past or they live in the future. The people that live, live in the past are the people who are still worried, mad, anxious, upset about something that happened 5, 10, 15 years ago. You'll hear people say, well, I'm still mad with Joe. Well, why are you mad with Joe? Well, 10 years ago, he did such and such and such, and they'll get mad and they'll pound to death. Their blood pressure will go up. They're just as mad about it as they were 10 years ago. Now, Joe hadn't thought about it in 10 years. He's gone on enjoying his life, moving on with it. You're sitting there worrying about something that happened 10 years ago that you can't change. That's ridiculous. Let it go. And then you have people living in the future. These are the people who say, I'll be happy when I graduate. I'll be happy when I get a job. I'll be happy when I get my student loans paid off. I'll be happy when I retire. I'll be happy when I get a promotion. I'll be happy when, when, when. Here's the problem. Not a one of us can change yesterday. Not a one of us has tomorrow promise. This is it. The genius of life is to recognize that right now, this day is your day to accomplish your purpose in life. And so enjoying the journey is really, really important. And I mean fun and laughter. But I mean, at a deeper level, that enrichment, that self-esteem, that self-actualization, that recognition that, <clears throat> that your life matters. So enjoying the journey is the fourth trait. And the fifth trait is to have an enthusiastic, positive attitude. Enthusiastic, positive attitude. Because in, invariably in life, we're going to have difficulties. We're going to have challenges. And so uh, if you go through life and you hit these bumps in the road, these challenges, and you don't have a positive attitude, then what happens is you let that rock your focus in terms of what you're trying to accomplish. You have a glass is half empty type of, type of focus. That doesn't work out very well. You need to be an optimist versus a pessimist. Let me tell you the difference between optimists and pessimists. Pessimists are people who, when a bad thing happens, they say, this bad thing happens, it's going to ruin my whole life, it's all my fault, and I'm never going to get over it. Nothing I can do about it. Optimists facing the very same challenge say, this bad thing happened. It's probably not going to affect my whole life. It's not going to last forever. It's not my fault anyway. I just got to deal with it, which they do. But they go ahead with an enthusiastic, positive attitude and move forward and accomplish their dreams and goals and hopes in life. And then the other aspect I want to share with you all is about finding real happiness. It's been interesting over this last year how many times I've talked with people and heard people say, you know, I'll be so glad when all this is over so I can be happy again. Well, that's not a really good way to live life because, as I said, you can't promise yourself tomorrow. It's not promised to you. And so waiting for COVID to be over, waiting for the economy to get better, waiting for anything is just not wise and, but it begs the question of, well, okay, but we've got all these challenges going on. What, can, what else can I do? What else can I do? In other words, is it possible to be happy even in difficult times? And the answer is absolutely yes. And there are four steps that I hope you will write down and think about because they will be important in terms of helping you be a happier and successful person. The first step in being happier is, believe it or not, very simple, and it is to choose to be happy. Just choose to be happy. You might say, well, that, that doesn't make much sense. I mean, why, why is that important? It's because 
most people do not believe that they have the right to choose to be happy. Rather, they believe that their happiness is a function of the environment around them. So these bad circumstances happen. You know, it's cloudy outside, it's rainy outside, the teacher's no good, my book's no good, we've got all these problems, and it means I just can't be, I can't be happy, my life is going to be miserable because I'm a victim. <clears throat> Pardon me, it does not have to be that way. You do not have to be a victim. You get to choose how you approach the reality. You can't change the reality most of the time, but you get to choose how you face the reality. The way I describe it to people is this. Think about that you are the 100% shareholder. You're the chairman and the CEO of this company called you. You get to run yourself. You get to decide. You can't change all the things that happen to you. You get to change how you think about and how you react to them. And that makes all the difference in the world in terms of your success and happiness. And then the second step on achieving happiness in difficult times is to be clear about your purpose in life. Be clear about your purpose in life. Just like I talked about earlier, for our company, for the United States of America, you need to be clear about what your purpose is. And it may not be evident to you right now. You're, most of you are still in school and you don't have, maybe have clarity about what your purpose is, but spend some time thinking about what you want to do with your life, not what your parents want you to do with your life, not, not what the world says you ought to do with your life, what do you want to do with your life? Because if you're not passionate about your purpose, then you're probably not going to be successful and, and happy. And we can, we can choose our purpose uh, if we will spend an appropriate amount of time on it. And oftentimes our purpose comes from circumstances that we've lived to, through. One of my five great books is called Man's Search for Meaning, written by Viktor Frankl. If you have not read it, I, I really encourage you to read it. Victor Frank Frankl survived the Holocaust, spent three years in Auschwitz, uh, lost all of his family members. But out of that, he gained the experience that helped him write this book. And in that book, he says something that's very powerful. It helps me a lot. He says, if you know your why, you can endure any how. So in another way, if you're clear about your purpose in life, you can figure out how to overcome obstacles. So being clear about what your purpose in life is, is a really, really important driver uh, in terms of your success and, and happiness. And then the third step in being happy is called having a growth mindset. A second of my five great books is called Mindset, written by Dr. Carol Dweck, D-W-E-C-K. If you have not read it, I strongly recommend it. Uh, because in that book, she talks about the two choices about how we think about life. Some people choose to have what's called a fixed mindset. A fixed mindset is a mindset where you believe that you really are fixed. You can't change, you can't grow, you can't improve. And so when circumstances come along, you quickly become the victim and you give up because you don't really believe you have the ability uh, to, to change and, and continue to grow. Growth mindset, on the other hand, is a, is a way of thinking where people say, I, ha I have the ability, I can change, I can learn, I can grow, I can improve, I can overcome these obstacles. I'm not going to blame it on everybody else. I do have all these problems. I'm not going to be the victim. I'm going to grow. I'm going to learn. I'm going to improve. I'm going to own responsibility for my life. Uh, and therefore, I approach life on a more positive basis. And I go out and find solutions rather than sitting around and agonizing, worrying about the problems. And so having a growth mindset is a big deal. The fourth is probably the most important, and that is to help others. Just help others. Now, that may sound really simple, and you may be saying, well, hey, wait a minute, I, mean, I can't really go out and help other people. I don't have the time, and I don't have the money. Uh, well, look, it doesn't take much time, and it doesn't take, in most cases, any money. What it is that helps people the most are the little things that go out and help people feel like that they are cared for, that their life matters, that they are important. It's the little smiles, it's the little pats on the back. And look, they've done a lot of studies. Many of you have heard about, or maybe even have even experienced what's called the runner's high. <clears throat> the runner's high is when you run to a certain point, uh, the body actually re releases endorphins. Uh, which is a chemical in the body that makes you feel better, makes you feel, quote unquote, happy. That's proven scientifically. Now they have proven scientifically that when you go help others, the brain does the same thing. 
it causes the body to release those chemicals and you have that feel good, that happy uh, feeling about knowing you've done something worthwhile. And so I challenge you to think about helping others, especially during times like right now. Even on your worst days, when times are difficult and you're facing your worst circumstances, that's the best time for you to think about helping others. And again, it is very small things that oftentimes matter the most. Several years ago, there was a young man in San Francisco who left his apartment, walked several miles to the Golden Gate Bridge, climbed to the top and jumped off to his immediate death. That afternoon, they found a note in his apartment and the note said, I'm gonna walk to the bridge. If one person smiles at me, I won't jump. Now you think about the reality of that. One person, one smile, one life. But there's another young man I can tell you about named Kevin Hines, and you can read about him on the internet. Uh, in I think 2010, he also made the walk to the bridge, climbed to the top and jumped off and survived. Now that was a miraculous thing because they've proven that when you jump off the top of the Golden Gate Bridge, it is like jumping off the top of a 28 story building when your body hits the water, it's like you're going 75 or 80 miles an hour, and it, and it basically splatters every bone in your body. Kevin Hines survived because when his body hit and he was about to drown, a sea lion came up and kept him afloat until the Coast Guard got there to, to save him. Now, I believe Kevin Hines has a clear purpose in life, and he does as well. He's written some books. He goes out and gives talks about his purpose in life. But he says the same thing the other young man that didn't survive said. He said, when I was walking to the bridge, all I deeply wanted was somebody, somebody to just say to me, Kevin, you're important. Your life matters. That little smile, that pat on the back, showing some interest in him was what he was looking for. And he expressed how he was so withdrawn, he was so deeply depressed that he couldn't reach out and say, help me. He needed someone to reach in and help him. And that's what happens with people all around you every day. I promise you now that we're 13, 14 months into this into this uh, COVID uh, experience, there are people all around you. The odds are most of you listening to me right now, whether you consciously admit it or not, are experiencing some level of anxiety, stress, in studies that have been done. It is very high today. Suicide rate is up. Drug use is up. Alcohol use is up. I saw one study that even instances like 40% of people honestly answered that during the pandemic that they have gained weight and the average weight gain was 29 pounds because people aren't as active and they don't seem to have a clarity of purpose and they're unhappy. And so they're letting all that begin to affect their bodies, which is understandable, but not, not good. And so doing these little things to help other people does two great things. It helps them and it helps you. So I challenge you with what I challenge my, my teammates at Truist uh, with a little exercise that I promise you, promise you if you try it, it will work. When you get up in the morning and you're getting ready to go to school or whatever you're getting ready to do, even before you greet any of your friends of your, or your loved ones at home, imagine somebody hands you a handful of seeds. These imaginary seeds are seeds of hope. And every time you go out and do a little something special, a little extra pat on the back, I hope you have a great day. Hey, how are you doing? And wait for the answer. Every time you do one of those, in your mind, take one of those little seeds and toss it down on the ground. You just planted a seed of hope. And if you would do that throughout your life, you won't get it perfect every day. Nobody does. But if you do that to the best of your ability, as your life draws close to an end, you'll be able to look back over your life You'll see all those little seeds that you planted. They will have sprouted up into flowers and rose bushes and big oak trees. You'll see that student that was having troubles in class and you helped them out a little bit and they ended up getting a good grade and went on to feel better about themselves. You'll find that family member who was really struggling in a divorce that you lent a helping hand to. You'll find people dealing with financial challenges that you loaned them a little extra money to help them through a tough time. You'll find all of those little situations that you helped with and you, and you planted that seed of hope and you changed the world. So I want you to remember something, especially students, 
you have the ability to change the world. You can change the world. But it is a process, and it is important for you to recognize that it is not easy to go through the process. All these steps I've just described to you, I will leave you and we'll go to Q&A. One uh, 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 analogy uh, that, that is, is meaningful in terms of thinking about, about this. So if you think about the, the caterpillar and the butterfly, you know, I've often thought about, maybe you have to, probably not, but I've often thought about, you know, a, a poor little caterpillar crawling around on the ground. Uh, I wonder if that caterpillar knows that it's going to be one day a butterfly. Because crawling around as a butterfly, I mean, a, a, a caterpillar can't be very much fun, right? I mean, it's crawling around, it's an ugly little worm, worrying about somebody stepping on it all the time. That can't be very much fun and very fulfilling. But if that caterpillar knows that it's going to be a butterfly one day, then that's a different view of the world. That purpose gives them the drive and the energy to be able to focus on moving forward through the process of learning and changing that they have to go through. So they have to go through this metamorphosis process where they go into cocoon, a safe haven, and scientists will tell you in that cocoon, every body part of the caterpillar changes as they become this beautiful butterfly. And so that commitment to go through that change process is what ends up allowing that caterpillar to become that beautiful butterfly. And so it's the same for us in life. I'm not saying you look like a worm now, so don't get mad with me. I'm just saying we all have challenges and difficulties in life, and I believe we all have a unique God-given purpose that will allow us to do something great and wonderful and change the world, but we have to go through a lot of changes, a lot of process in the meantime to get to where we need to be. Moving from that reality today to that vision in the future takes courage. It takes courage. And if you will be courageous about your life, courageous about your future, then you can change the world. Well, let me stop there, Dr. McIntyre, and uh, I think it's about time for us to do Q&A, and I have just a quick wrap-up at the end. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for those words. I will say I have just discovered the, one of the disadvantages of having a Zoom session instead of face-to-face -face is that uh, typically when we're face-to-face, -face, I get to ask the first question while students come down to the microphone to ask a question, but we have a number of questions. So I'm gonna get to those first so that you can answer them. And the first one I think goes along with uh, just a congratulations, 49 years with Truist, that's mm -hmm. amazing. Uh, Josh Kirkland asked, when you started working in 1972, how many co-workers did you have and what motivated you to stay with the company? Not many people stay with a company for 49 years. Yeah, Josh, that's a good question. So when I started in 72, um, we were about a $250 million bank. Um, we had about uh, 2,000 uh, employees. We were the 330th largest bank in the country. Today, we are 520 billion with the sixth largest commercial bank in the country, and we have 55,000 teammates. Now, what made me stay? Uh, that's a really good question, and it's a long story. I'll give you the short version, but this, this could maybe be helpful to some of you. Um, there were many times, uh, because I worked hard and I was blessed, and I got promotions, and there were many times when I got offers to go leave the company and go do other things. Uh, you can actually read about this, but uh, we, we had a bad set of circumstances in our company many years ago where we had two CEOs back to back, each one who died in office at 53 years old. And so uh, the second one to die, Mr. Vincent Lowe, was the president who recruited myself and four other uh, young people right out of college, all had just gotten MBAs. He wanted to change the future of the company. We were stuck in Eastern North Carolina as an agricultural farm bank. The world was changing and he saw that we had to have a new vision and he saw we needed to have some talent to help lead us towards that vision. So he hired the five of us and kind of mentored us through all those years. Now, he died just a few years later, but then one of us, my predecessor, John Allison, whom you know, became our CEO. So we were all 40 years old and, and, and running the company. 
Uh, and uh, it was to me, someone asked me this question the other day, and I said, well, you know, to me, it was really like a team sport. I grew up on a farm. We were very, very poor, and I never got to play sports. I never got to play football or basketball or anything. So when I came together with this group of four of my buddies, it was like a team for me, and, and we were just having fun. We, we were all achievers. We didn't care much about making money. We didn't care about recognition, but we cared a lot about transforming this company into all it could become. And we worked together all those years. Uh, all my buddies have now retired. They left me holding the bag, <laughs> but, uh, but it's still, just, I have the same feeling today. It's about achieving what we can achieve, that purpose. Uh, and, and so I've stayed because it wasn't about being CEO. It wasn't about making the most money. I could have changed and maybe done more of that earlier. Uh, it was about achieving a worthwhile purpose. What a wonderful answer. Uh, Ebony folks asked, what steps other than open dialogue has your company taken towards diversity and inclusion training and other resources for your employees? Well, Ebony, we've been doing a lot, uh, as you might imagine, uh, in the last year uh, around uh, equity and inclusion. But I want to I want to start out by pointing out something that I stress to our team all the time. A lot of times people talk about diversity and, and they chase numbers. You know, we're going to have X numbers of, of diverse uh, employees or we call them teammates. That's great. But diversity without equitable opportunity and have an equitable opportunity without everybody being inclusive is, is not is not effective. You can be really diverse and have no inclusivity and you haven't accomplished anything. I mean think about it. The goal the goal is for every teammate to come to work every day inspired about our purpose, uh, to inspire and build better lives and communities. The the idea is for everybody to get up in the morning excited about coming to work. Why? because we're working together as a team, just like I just described about my own life, we're working together as a team to achieve something worthwhile. But, but if people are afraid, if they're feeling like they're second class, if they're feeling like they're intimidated because of their color or, 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 or their gender or any other non-essential factor, then they're not included. And if they're not included, they're not included. And if you don't include everybody so that you have a really good, composite, diverse team, you cannot be your best. You just cannot be your best. Uh, and so we have, uh, number one, stressed that. Number two, uh, we are holding a lot of what we call days of understanding. And you mentioned dialogue. A dialogue is really important. Uh, we've had, I don't know, probably 100 of these in the last year where we uh, set a time uh, and we talk about, and we start with particular groups. We have groups that we call uh, business resource groups, or BRGs. So we have a women's group, African-American group, a Latino group, uh, Asian-American, um, um, we got about 12. Uh, and they band together and they can share together and learn and grow together. And so we'll have these days of understanding and then others are invited to come in and, and, and meet with them and be allies. I meet with a lot of them, and I get to hear firsthand from them telling me what their challenges are. And I'll tell you, it's it's eye-opening. I'll just share a brief, and I, I attended one last week, and it was with our Asian-American uh, Pacific Islander group, and we had a lot of people on the phone, I mean, on the webcast, <clears throat> and, and it, you would be surprised how many people just said uh, that they are sad and scared every day when they leave their apartment or their home. Th this one lady said that she and her husband finally, after a year, got up the nerve to leave and go grocery shopping. So she was so excited about finally going to the store and, and shopping. Um, but they pulled up in front of the store and two cars down was a truck that had a American flag in the back. They just noticed it and they went on inside and, and uh, after a little bit of time, her husband grabbed her and moved her way across the store. She, and he told her, he said, that man from that truck was really staring at you in a mean way. And, and, and I was scared for you. And she said she left that store and she's been scared ever since. And I've heard many, many stories like this. So, so, so talking about it 
is really important because it helps us to feel better psychologically to express what's on our mind. That's, that's a key learning in life. If you got something on your mind that's really bothering you, find a good person you can trust and tell them what's on your mind. Just expressing it helps. But the other thing is we learned that we can help each other. And so we're learning ways inside Truist to help each other uh, deal with some of these challenges. Uh, and we're doing a number of other things, but I would say the most important is having these regular dialogues uh, where everybody can openly in a safe place share what's bothering them, and then we can work together to think about how we can help. And to use your earlier analogy, it's hard for people to, to be on a team and play those team sports if they don't feel included and valued. Well, but that, that's right, Dr. McIntyre, because if you know if if you're sitting there and you're the tenth player on on the on the field or sitting on the sidelines and nobody really 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 wants you to be a player and really wants you to have an equal and equitable opportunity is and so it's depressing and it's demeaning and it doesn't bring out the best in us. So uh, that's a challenge for all of us. And uh, team sport analogy is a good one. Great. The next question comes from. Uh, Fred O'Neill, how will Truist appeal to the new types of banking customers, those who utilize internet banks and other means of exchange? Well, Fred, thanks for asking. Um, we are really, really focused on the new, I, I, won't, I won't really say the new younger people, because what's interesting is uh, we're finding all clients of all ages and all types are demanding extreme uh, convenience in terms of technology uh, and availability of services. So when we created Truist a little over a year ago, one of the most important things we did was a commitment to innovation. So in our, I'm sitting in our, our main office building in, in Charlotte right now, and in this building, we, by this late summer, we're going to have an innovation and technology center. It's going to be about the size of two football fields. Some of you ought to come up and visit it. Uh, it's going to be awesome. Uh, but it's going to be where we uh, basically, if you will, manufacture the products and services that the client of, the, of, of today and the future demand. The, the change in my lifetime is incredible. The change in the last five years is incredible in terms of the demand for real-time delivery. So, so when the Amazon effect took effect about 10 years ago, the world changed. It was a giant paradigm shift. And now the world says, I want what I want, when I want it, right here, right now, right in the palm of my hand, end of story. And if you can't deliver that, then you're not even on the end of consideration set. Now, this is something you might want to think about and talk about in class. We've created a concept we call T3, which I believe uh, grabs the idea uh, of the main shift in what retail America and, and including banking needs to consider as you think about that client. So historically, technology was a backroom concept. So we had computers in the back room, they helped process checks fast and all that stuff. The, the whole relationship with the client was the front room, it was the touch side of the business. So if you had better people in the branches, you could win. Uh, you only had a problem with technology if the computer broke down one night. Well, when, when Amazon effect hit, the technology moved right to the client. And, and, and many of the fintechs in the world believe that's all it is to it. That, you know, if you've got the bit latest and greatest, uh, you know, online mobile computing platform, then you win the game because the best have the best technology. It's not that simple. What T3 means is T stands for technology, touch, and trust. And so the winning formula in the future is the seamless integration of technology and touch to yield a high level of trust because the value proposition has not changed. The value proposition is expressed by V equals Q divided by P. Value is the function of quality divided by price. Quality used to be all about the, the human touch. Now quality is about that intersection between technology and touch. Because look, sometimes don't we all know, the computer just doesn't work, right? You wake up one morning and it didn't charge. And <laughs> now you got a big problem. So sometimes it just doesn't work. But, but other times, the, the, the need of the client is more complex uh, and, and they want to talk to a human being. What is a major problem? They want to talk to a human being. And the, and the genius is to have it all integrated so that when the technology needs to be augmented by the touch, it's seamless 
so that the client never feels an interruption. They don't say there's technology over here and there's touch over here, or there's technology in the morning, there's touch at night. It's all there available for them all the time. Thank you for your response. That's the same conversation we have in our firm. I'm a 30 year guy, 30 plus year at Everett Jones and a senior guy. So we're talking those same things, King. So I appreciate that. I'll share that your thoughts somewhat with our management group, as well as uh, many of us are shareholders with uh, Truist, as well as we provide that as one of our investing solutions. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that feedback. And I will use T3 in the classroom. So thank you for that. Good. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, Eric Smith has a question. When you talked about staying focused on the vision, not becoming distracted, how do you stay focused uh, in the midst of two things? First of all, is that constant flux of politics, public opinion, other challenges, things that are changing faster than ever? And second, the demand for leaders to talk about all of those fast changing issues. How do you stay focused in the midst of all of that? Well, I'll tell you, Eric, that's a, that's a really timely question right now with all that's going on. I mean, if you read any periodical today or listen to any discussions, you'll find that, you know, CEOs especially, but, but all across leadership, uh, we're all being pressed to, you know, respond to this, respond to that, take positions on this. A lot of, lot of debate, a lot of energy, a lot of anger. Um, and it's really tempting, and you see this happen, for people to jump right in that fray and look, there, there, there are important topics and issues that companies and CEOs need to speak out about. Um, but, but all too often, I think uh, they let their personalities get in the way and they get too involved in things that really is, is maybe not what they ought to spend most of their, their time on. What I, the way I do it is I stay focused on our purpose. There are a thousand things that happen during the course of my day that can pull me, up, pull me off to the left or the right. I stay centered, focused on our purpose. I wake up in the morning thinking, what can I do today to help ensure we do the best job of inspiring and building better lives in communities? What can I do? My whole purpose right now is doing the best job I can possibly do to help inspire and build your lives in the community of the university so that it's more successful, maybe by just a tiny bit because of this time. If so, then I've been successful. If not, then I'll learn from it. So, but by coming back to the purpose, because so what will happen is in life, you know, you have some bad event will happen, something that will get you totally distracted. People that don't have clarity of purpose, when they get pulled off to the left or the right in life on some tangent, some problem, they stay over there. They don't know how to get back because they don't know where they were. They don't know where they're going. That's why having clarity of vision, clarity of purpose is so important. Coming all the way back to your North Star every time is the most important way of staying centered uh, and effective in life. Excellent. We are running short on time, so I'm going to ask uh, questions, not necessarily in the order that they came, but a few things just to kind of wrap us up. And I love Elaine Heath Ward's question. What was the biggest challenge you've had to overcome in your life and in your career? Wow, that's a good one. Um, I, I think the biggest uh, challenge for me, just to be very honest, was um, deciding what life was really all about. When I, when I started out, again, I, I grew up very, very poor. Uh, my, my father was an alcoholic. I'm, I'm, we had a very sad childhood. I'm very proud of him. He stopped drinking later. He was a fine Christian, and, 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 and I love him to death, but, but we had a tough childhood. Uh, and the result of that for child children of alcoholics is they oftentimes come out real dominating, real charging, real in control, uh, and they can create leadership problems for you. So I was moving up the ladder really fast. I was doing great. Everything was wonderful, but I was miserable. I was really unhappy in life because I found that the world's definition of success oftentimes does not bring you happiness. So I was making good money, getting good titles, getting good promotions. All that was great. I was miserable. So I had, to, I had to really figure out life. And in my case, not trying to influence you, I was just an honest answer to the question. In my case, it was about uh, getting clear about the reality that there is a higher, there's a higher source of power. And so I developed a deep faith, I've been deep in it over time, uh, and it helped me get clear about my purpose in, in life. And so 
once I got clear about my purpose, my personal purpose, uh, then it was very clear that my personal purpose was aligned with the company's purpose. And so now I have this peaceful situation where I'm doing personally and professionally exactly what I want to do, and it's exactly the same uh, in, in, in each case. And so that was my challenge. And fortunately, I was blessed to be able to get on the right track. And, and it's been a good career since then. Wonderful. And Joanna Crosby, I assume the answer to her question is yes, but you may be able to point her to resources. She's asking, does Truist offer internships for financial advisors? Apparently, you have uh, inspired her to look closely at your company. <laughs> We, we do have internships for financial advisors. In fact, we, we have, uh, have quite a few each, each year. Uh, and if you want to just drop me a note, I'll get your name and information to the right people, and I'll ask them to get in touch with you. I can't guarantee you anything, but I'll, I'll make sure you get an interview. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. And I know we are wrapping up. I want to end this last one. I, I, know I was going to ask one final question, but this is really just a comment. And it, it's something that we often hear after these lectures, but we don't often hear them during them. And this is coming from Lindsay uh, Wessels. She's saying, more people should hear this message. I believe many people in the country need to. So that is just a, a kudos to you. It is a wonderful message. I, I, I have learned so much. I've got three pages of notes here that I'm gonna incorporate into to my lectures to students and certainly into uh, a lot of the conversations that I have with others. But I wanna thank you. We do have a small gift for you. It's <clears> black. <throat> I'm not sure if it's gonna show up because it's clear. Oh, it's but beautiful, we will, thank you. <laughs> we will <laughs> ship this to you. It's just a small thank you for your time and for your energy today. You have been most inspiring. Mm -hmm. uh, I will turn it over to you for a few words and then close us out for the day. Well, thank you, Dr. McIntyre. I appreciate that. And thanks to the audience. I wish I could be there with you all. Maybe next time, if you invite me back, we'll be able to do it in person. Uh, and, and I'll look forward to that. So I, I just bring, I just wanted to leave you with this challenge. Uh, and that is, uh, is really my hope and my prayer for you. And that is that you get up every morning and choose to be happy. You go ahead and be clear about what your purpose in life is. Don't drift through life. Don't wait like many people do to the way down the road in life to figure out why you are here. Know why you are here. Think about it. You can figure it out. You just got to focus on it. And be sure to have a growth mindset. Be sure to understand that you can change. You can learn. You can grow. You have amazing power, amazing ability to learn. Take advantage of all the resources that are right there available in front of you at the university. Learn everything you can learn. Be committed to learning and growing. Be around people who will help you learn and grow. Be around people that are different than you. Just view life as this giant cocoon, this giant chance to grow and change and improve and be all you can be. And get out there every day and help others every time you have a chance. And don't forget when you get up tomorrow morning, please write down and remember, Hold your hand open and let somebody hand you that handful of seeds, those seeds of hope. And just try this for me. Go out and do at least one little nice extra thing for somebody and literally in your mind, throw that little seed on the ground and plant that seed because in doing so, you may be surprised to know the truth and that is you can change the world. A single little butterfly can flap its wings on one side of the earth and create a hurricane all the way around the world. Now, you know for sure, if a little bitty butterfly can do that, then your life matters. You can change the world. God bless you all. Thank you so much for your time. And I will say just for the record, you are always welcome at West Georgia. Intend that as, a, as an open invitation. Anytime you're in the area, please do stop by. I hope that you have uh, the opportunity just to look in the chat function because a lot of our students and, and guests are sending you thanks and comments about what a wonderful speech this was. Uh, thank you, Mr. King, for joining us today. Thank you to all who have been in the audience. Hope you have a wonderful day and uh, enjoy the sunshine. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.